Good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study. My name is Clagert Mitchell and I serve as lead pastor here at South County Bible Church. I invite you to open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 6. We're looking at one of the fundamental disciplines of the Christian faith and that's prayer. Throughout church history, great movements of God, uh, great times of revival or just seasons when lots of people were responding to the gospel, all of them find their roots, uh, their, their initiation, if you will, in a prayer meeting. When, when believers gather together and join in prayer uh, to, to plead with God and to, to pray in accordance with God's will uh, in, in Jesus' name uh, for God to be glorified uh, through his people and, and here on earth. The great preachers of the past, the most influential theological thinkers have always been men of prayer who are surrounded by people of prayer. Now, I've heard sermons and preachers talk at length about the weakness of the church at any given time and how that weakness is visible because so few people attend church prayer meetings uh, in, in their local church anymore. And in some ways, I agree. A lack of commitment, a lack of setting aside the time or making praying with your church family a priority, uh, you know, that's bad. And yes, any church, every church, where prayer is not a priority, uh, you're going to find an unhealthy, unstable, spiritually weak church. In fact, I really appreciate something I read uh, from Nancy Lita Moss. Uh, she was writing and she put together a list. Uh, she said, I am convinced that prayerlessness is, and then she listed a bunch of things. Here's some of what she listed. She said, prayerlessness is uh, a sin against God. Uh, prayerlessness is a direct disobedience to the command of Christ to watch and pray. Uh, prayerlessness is direct disobedience to the word of God. Uh, prayerlessness makes me vulnerable to temptation. Um, Prayerlessness expresses independence. You know, you act like you don't need God. Uh, prayerlessness gives place to the enemy and makes me vulnerable to his schemes. Um, prayerlessness, and this is really key for us, results in powerlessness. Uh, prayerlessness limits uh, and defines our relationship with God. Prayerlessness uh, hinders me from knowing God's will, God's priorities, God's direction. It forces me to operate in the realm of the natural, just depending on what I can do, uh, instead of the supernatural, which is dependent on what God can do, um, and, and other things. It was just a, really a great list that, that, uh, of, of things that she put down talking about um, of what prayerlessness really looks like. Well, to put it simply, prayerlessness is bad. It's just bad. Prayerlessness is the only ingredient that you need for disaster, for, for just waste. Now, all of that being said, I have to tell you, uh, for many years, I've struggled over the issue that I want to address tonight. Not the discipline of prayer itself. I mean, I, I pray for people. I pray about things. Yes, I experience times when I'm too self-reliant. Uh, and I'm not praying as I, as I ought to be. Um, but the struggle that I'm describing this evening and that I want to address a little bit this evening is related to some of the really common, often repeated church habits and church traditions. I'm not convinced that the practices that we've been shown, uh, I'm not convinced that they're just automatically correct or valid, um, starting with the very common uh, church prayer sheet. Now, a prayer, a personal prayer sheet uh, can be a super great tool, very helpful. A personal prayer sheet helps us to remember things. It helps hold us accountable, especially if we're writing stuff down. Uh, it helps us learn to love others as we pray for other people. It helps us magnify our in intercession for others and, and, uh, and, and whatever the concerns are that are on our hearts. Uh, personal prayer sheet can help remind us to give thanks, especially when we are careful to record answers to prayer uh, over the course of time. But there really are serious concerns, uh, real dangers, when it comes to the church keeping a list 
and then providing an official document. Why do I say that? Well, because it can become a gossip sheet, either giving gossip or receiving gossip. It might publish private information or wrong information. It can certainly be an unnecessary burden, which I'll explain in just a moment, uh, a kind of passing of the burden on to other people, uh, can become a source of pride or arrogance, even self-centeredness. An official church document can actually, uh, it really can. I, I would argue that it can lead to prayerlessness and a lack of participation. By the way, do you realize that churches did not always use an, an official prayer sheet? Uh, the people who participated in, in prayer meetings uh, did not spend all of their time in prayer for the needs of all the people who were not participating in the prayer meeting itself. I'm just, just being honest here. I've, I have a really hard time uh, with this. I mean, prayer is hard work. Praying for others is to share in their burden which is a good thing. It is something we need to do and should do. And, and, and we have a privilege of participating in and, and, and loving others by praying for them. I'm not at all suggesting that we don't do that. But if we are genuinely spending time interceding in prayer on behalf of, of, of another person, uh, you are helping that person, which is right, it is good, it is a tremendous help. And if you know the person intimately and share in their burden personally, then you will intercede faithfully and effectively. But, but hear me, if you don't, then you won't. It should be a serious concern whenever an official church document is filled with needs and concerns and, and oftentimes names of people that, that you don't know personally. It is very possible that someone somewhere uh, asked for prayer, then, then uh, asked a particular person for prayer or said, hey, would you pray? And it gets passed on and eventually onto a document as though the, that somehow being printed on the piece of paper uh, guarantees that it's going to be prayed for. Well, that's a burden because, and it puts the burden on those who would take the list and go through it. Uh, even if they don't know anything about anything that's on the list. Here's the thing. As a pastor, my genuine concern is really simple. Prayer is one of the most powerful weapons, the greatest tools, uh, most awesome things that we can engage in or use. If you, if you ask just about any Christian, uh, is there power in prayer? I think the vast majority would very likely say absolutely yes, but then they would also quickly respond or quickly confess uh, they have very limited experience with that level of power in prayer in their own life. So is our concept of what prayer looks like, sounds like, feels like, or takes aim at, is it correct? The question that I'm asking is simply this. Are we doing it right? Are we doing it right? Let me address a couple of things with you this evening that will help us think through this. Uh, and I hope you're encouraged. I hope you're challenged a little bit. Um, I hope you don't come away. I hope you don't just shut this off and then say, ah, he's lost it, I'm done. I hope you'll hear me out and that you'll come away challenged and, and even somewhat encouraged. Let me address a couple of things with this, with this train of thought this evening. First of all, um, some people always pray the exact same prayer. They may use words straight out of the Bible, even word for word, or, or, or just uh, repeat prayers that they've heard or that they've read. And they, they, just, that they, they get one, they like it, and they just do that over and over. Friends, one repeated prayer, and it doesn't matter how often you repeat it, that does not give you a prayer life. That does not make you a prayer warrior. There's a pastor I know who, who, uh, who likes to say uh, something like, uh, prayers without variety eventually become words without meaning. Prayers without variety eventually become words without meaning. Well, there's a serious, 
uh, thought and, and warning there for us. In fact, um, if you look at Matthew chapter 6, uh, where, where you should have opened a moment ago, uh, Matthew chapter 6, just look at verse 7. Jesus says, And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Don't miss that incredibly important statement that Jesus makes. Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles uh, do. Don't, 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 don't rush past that. The Gentile way of, of praying that Jesus is referring to is, is basically just pagan superstition. And it's the kind of pagan superstition that just repeats the same things over and over and over again with the thought that if I do it enough or I'm sincere enough, I'll get heard and I'll receive what I'm after. Friends, God despises mindless repetition and he hates hypocrisy, especially when it comes to prayer. Which, by the way, is why the rest of the prayers recorded in the New Testament, they follow the model of Jesus' lesson here on prayer, but not the form. In other words, we don't ever read of the early Christians just repeating Jesus' words, even, even in this passage in Matthew 6. Uh, they don't just repeat them ritualistically. They don't just repeat them verbatim in a monotone, and if I just say them enough times, God will listen. We never see that in Scripture. We should never think that we have found, you know, just the right words to use and then rely on those words as the sum total of our prayer life. It means it, 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 it may seem uh, more simple. It may seem easy to just sort of lean on one prayer that you know from memory. Uh, but please understand, there is no, uh, there are no simple magic words or magic formula to get God to do our bidding. Prayer is about talking to God and worshiping God through communing with God. Prayer is about my heart being persuaded that God is God and that he has made a way for me to draw close to him, to have intimacy with him, to be able to express my innermost heart and mind before him, knowing that he's listening and ready, willing, and able to respond the right way in the right time according to his will on my behalf. If your prayer life does not reflect your personal intimacy with God, your, your, your growing relationship with God, then you probably don't know the power of prayer. And, and what time you do spend in prayer, um, forgive me, but it's worthless. It's empty. It, it is just more of that feeling like, well, I tried to pray, but I, didn't f I felt like my words didn't get any higher than the ceiling. As someone might say, that's because they were empty. That's because they didn't go any higher than the ceiling. Listen, the entire Bible is our guide to prayer, which means that if we willfully neglect what God says about prayer and just rely on our own empty phrases and vain repetitions and, and what we think seems profound, we're just wasting our time. We're just wasting our breath. Talking to God is too great a privilege to waste our time or to waste our breath, especially when the Bible invites us, as Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is our refuge for us. Now, so we don't pray the same thing. Don't get stuck just saying the same thing over and over. Let me give you one other piece of this that that, that is a... Um, a concern. I think it's helpful, and I hope and I, I can explain it in a way that you'll track with. Uh, let me give you a few thoughts from the Gospel of John. Um, the Gospel of John, uh, more than one time, John 14, 13, says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, the, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 15, 16, Jesus is speaking of, of uh, our bearing fruit that lasts, and he says this, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, 
he may give it to you. John 16, verse 23 and 24. In that day, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of my father in my name, he will give to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you'll receive that your joy may be full. All those statements, every single one of them, Jesus says, uh, uses the same phrase. Uh, you ask in my name. You ask in my name. Now, most of the time, you hear a Christian pray, I do this, you probably do this, and at the end of the praying, uh, kind of at the, 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 the way we sign off is we say, in Jesus' name, amen. The problem is, very often, that is just the tagline that we use or that we add at the end uh, after praying through a bunch of stuff that are all about our interests and not his. So let me, try and, let me try and explain this for you. There, there's, there's often a tendency in the church to think that, you know, you have to have uh, warm and fuzzy or else it's, it's not powerful. Uh, you know, we have to have a big sense of reverence or a throbbing awareness of humility. Um, you have to have a tingling sense of God's presence. Uh, if we just... Uh, really, 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 truly feel like we are super sincere or deeply earnest before the Lord, well, then God is going to hear our prayer and give us what we want. At the, at, at the time, uh, I didn't understand. Uh, years ago, um, there was this, this person that walked up and whispered kind of at me very aggressively in, in, in their tone. They just walked up and they said, Pastor C, are you feeling it? Are you feeling it? I didn't know what they meant. I, 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 I just kind of dismissed and, and went on. Look, I, I'm asking what, what, what is our foundation? Do we think that God will hear our prayers for Jesus' sake or for our sake? For his glory or our glory? That's kind of the question. Do we think God will be pleased on the basis of our feeling it, on our, on our, our sense of, of presence and, and, and our emotion? Let me say it like this. Um, yeah, think about it like this. Uh, do we believe that our prayers based on our, are, are based on our feelings, on our sincerity, on our on our uh, earnestness or our reverence somehow deserve to be heard? That's what I'm asking. Do we really believe that our great humility deserves to be rewarded? Sometimes we act like that. And when we do, if we do, then I submit to you we are insulting God. Because we are dragging his divine perfections, his divine attributes down to our finite, limited, wretched selves. To pray in the name of Jesus Christ has nothing to do with, with my, uh, you know, my hope or my expectation of, of being heard based on the merits of my good prayers. To pray in Jesus' name is to place all of my trust in Christ's perfections. It is to, it is to have confidence in his perfect intercession on my behalf. You see, my concern is that we drift into the, the, the vain repetition of useless phrases based on what we want, our will done in heaven, to the point that it's worthless. And there is, there is no power. We feel like our prayers don't get any higher than the ceiling. If we spend time praying like that, then I submit to you, we're acting as though we believe, uh, not as though we believe God's grace or God's goodness or God's love or God's power. If, if our prayer lives are based on our feelings and thinking that God is going to respond to us rather than uh, our response to him through Christ, um, we're going to lack the power. We're, not, we're acting like we don't believe in God's grace, like we don't know anything about what God's word says. 
For us to pray in Jesus' name is for us to take refuge in Christ as God's beloved Son, who is himself the one whom the Father delights to hear and to honor. We absolutely and rightly condemn praying to idols. But church, if I may be so bold, how often do we pray to the idol of self? How often do we bow our knees to the God of self? We even at times go so far as to write out lists of the ways that we want God to do our bidding, as though God is our servant. Brothers and sisters, no one, uh, uh, no one has the right to make those kind of demands of God. One of, the, one of the very reasons why it is possible for us to, to go in prayer and ask and then not have power and not receive any kind of answer at all is because we ask in our own name. We ask, it's all about uh, us. We ask for us and because of us and, and with us in view, it's all about us rather than being all about Christ. Let me say it like this. What I'm talking about is, is not any different than one of my children comes up to me and says, Dad, uh, just want you to know that I cleaned my room without being told. You should totally uh, reward we, me with some ice cream. Dad, I, 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 I put all my laundry in the laundry basket, and I'm kind of thinking maybe that needs to be a paid chore today. You should give me money. Uh, Dad, I was nice to my sister today. Can I have some candy? See, if, if your child came up to you thinking that he has the right to tell you how to reward him, or thinking that he has the right to tell you uh, what you should do in your response to your child, how would you respond? What would, what would you do? Would you cater to your child's selfish demands? Would you, would you think that your child knows better than you do about what they need or even what they've done or how they're, they're motivated by it? Um, prayer is, 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 is this incredible blessing that God has given to us. And yes, there is power in prayer. But friends, prayer is not about making God listen to what we want. It is about our finding out what He wants. Power in prayer is not about my personal wish list. It's about trusting and yielding and seeking and knowing God's will. Power in prayer is not about bringing information to God. It's about experiencing intimacy with God. So here's the test. Here's the test uh, for your prayers. It's real simple. When you pray, are you praying for my will to be done or for your will to be, Father, your will to be done? What are you asking? What's your motive? What's your heart? Are, does your prayer life reflect more like, God, this is what I want, this is what I expect? Or, God, I trust you. What do you want? What do you desire? What is your will? I trust you. I have confidence in you. Because of Christ, your word is true, and I believe. I urge you. I encourage you. I dare you. I exhort you to reconsider what you pray, how you pray, why you pray. And then, brothers and sisters, lean into the truth of Scripture Lean in and learn to crave God in heaven more than you crave peace and safety, health and wealth on the earth. And then just see if you don't experience the power of prayer, quite possibly like never before. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you and I do thank you for loving us enough not to leave us as we were. I thank you for loving us enough to convict us, to confront us, to 
challenge us, stretch us, even force us to ask hard questions and do some self-evaluation like, like this really kind of calls for. I pray, Father, that you would help us to learn or relearn what it means to pray, to engage in prayer. What does it really mean to be a prayer warrior? Help us, Father, to have soft hearts and teachable minds. Help us to grow in this incredible discipline of prayer. Help us to, to, to always be wary of getting stuck in a rut. Help us to just truly and powerfully experience your will and your power and your grace and your mercy and your love in our prayers and in our lives. Father, we need you. All of this I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, we look forward to seeing you this Sunday um, on our live stream. Uh, this is our Sunday. We're going to uh, share in communion uh, together. Um, you, you don't have to have special items for it. The, the communion table, like, um, like several things, is something that is symbolic. It represents the truth, and uh, we will examine the truth. We will remind ourselves of the truth of Scripture, and uh, then we'll partake of the bread that represents Jesus' body and the cup, which is representative of Jesus' blood. Um, so you don't have to rush out and get any special things. Uh, just, just make sure that if you're going to participate with us, uh, if you're a believer and you're going to participate with us, that uh, you have a, a piece of bread and a cup uh, for each of the uh, people in your house that's going to participate. And then we'll give instructions as we go through. You'll understand as we'll, we'll share in that together this Sunday. Uh, we're looking forward to the month of June. Uh, we have plans uh, to, to start uh, opening up, and uh, we're going to get those plans out to you very soon uh, so you'll understand how things will be working and functioning. And, and um, we just miss you all very, very much, and we're looking forward to uh, times we get back together as, uh, as the body. And, um, and uh, yeah, we just, we're just so excited about um, the days that are ahead. Um, love you all. Have a great rest of the week. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.